Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today we're going to be taking a detailed look at the entire Grand Cathay unit roster. Now the stats we'll be seeing today are going to be more relevant for multiplayer battles than for single player campaigns, as you will have a multitude of ways of improving the stats of your units throughout your campaign. But regardless, we'll be taking a look at how all these units are designed and what their intended purposes are in your armies. So getting started with the cheapest infantry unit, we have the Peasant Long Spearman. Now this unit will cost 350 in multiplayer, and is the cheapest unit available to the Grand Cathay faction. And as a cheap spear infantry unit, the Peasant Long Spearman fulfills the role of an expendable frontline unit designed to absorb enemy charges. So if we take a look at the stats, the Peasant Long Spearman seems worthless with low stats in almost all categories. The only redeeming factors are the decent amount of leadership at 55, and a nice 17 point bonus against large. But what really makes this unit useful is its passive abilities. First we have Expert Charge Defense, which will allow it to negate the charge bonus of any attacker when braced, and you can combine that with Charge Reflection, which will allow it to deal additional damage when attacking charging enemies. How this works in Warhammer is you will do two times your regular damage against charging enemies when braced if you have charge reflection. So this will be reflected on your weapon strength over here by multiplying that by two. In addition to this, uh, this obviously is a great unit to throw into your roster given its cheap cost and its expendable uh, passive ability there, which allows nearby units that are also not expendable to not lose any leadership when this unit routes, so it will not affect the rest of your army should it route off the battlefield. And as a tier 1 unit, it has 160 uh, units per retinue here, and the mass is quite low. That has to do with unit collision, so I'm just going to showcase that. As you see later units, you have a better feel for the relative values, but just note that 100 is pretty much as low as you can expect, and that means if an enemy large unit or cavalry charges at you, you will suffer some knockback. But at the same time, as you stay in combat, you will try to stay in formation with the formation attack trait, so even after knockback, you'll still try to gather back in this formation that you have here. Uh, it also has the ability to hide in forests, and as we mentioned, expendable. Lastly, as with all Grand Cathay units, will have one of the two harmony traits. If you're a melee unit, you have Yang. If you're a range unit, you have Ying. And what you need is another complementary piece within 45 meter of you to receive additional leadership and melee defense bonus for melee units or leadership and reload skill bonus for range unit. And there are gonna be additional multipliers on certain lords, heroes, and units that can amplify the effect of this battle harmony up to 100% more. So it can be 6 points up to 12 points depending on if you have any amplifier effects nearby as well. So that's going to do it for our Peasant Long Spearman. Moving on to our next infantry unit, we have the sword variant version of the Jade Warriors, which will cost 500 in multiplayer. Now the big difference here between the Jade Warriors and the Peasant Long Spearman is going to be the massive increase in armor as well as the shield that they're going to be carrying. This is going to be sort of the default shield for the Grand Cathay faction. You're going to see it on a lot of units, and this is going to block 35% of small arms missile fire from hitting you from the front. In addition to that, the rest of the stats is not really uh, that great. There is a focus on defense with a high melee defense of 36, which will be increased farther with the battle harmony mechanic of Yang. Uh, up to 12 points given the right amount of amplifiers and in units near you. In addition to that, you also have the defensive stance, which is a passive ability that allow you to gain additional stats when braced for a long time. So when you're not moving past 10 seconds, you will gain up to 25% additional charge resistance and another 10 point of armor to your already very high armor stat. And all of this reinforces the defensive nature of this unit. This is going to be a tier one unit but the number of unit will drop to 120 from 160 from the peasant long spearman uh, the mass will go up a little bit i guess for the armor but still quite a light unit in that regard uh, there's not too much else to see here so let's move on 
The 700 cost, we have the Halberd variant of the Jade Warriors. So these are going to be carrying a two-handed Halberd instead of the sword and shield. They will have the same 80 points of armor, but without the shield, they will lose the range block chance. They'll gain additional damage, in particular a 16 point bonus versus large and a heavier emphasis on armor piercing damage with the 8 and 20 split here compared to the sword variety which will be mainly base damage. Uh, the defense focus is still the same and because they're holding a polearm weapon they will regain charge defense and charge reflection. But the charge defense here is only against large, so unlike the peasant long spearmen, you will only be negating the charges of any large attacker. Uh, any light unit hitting you, you will still be absorbing their charge bonus. Charge reflection works the same. Against any charging enemy, you'll do double damage back. They still retain the defensive stance, giving them better charge resistance and armor. Uh, charge resistance has to do with your ability to avoid knockback from your mass uh, issue. So that's how that is applied. Overall, it's a very similar unit to the sword variety. You are just switching up your weapon, you're better against charging enemies. It's still a defense focus unit first, and you're pretty much a specialized anti-large unit here for the Grand Cathay army. Then finally, at 1,100 cost, we have the most expensive infantry option for Grand Cathay with the Celestial Dragon Guards. Uh, this is going to be a mighty unit that can one-hand the two-handed halberd we've seen before and still use a shield. Uh, this shield will still protect you for 35% range block chance. You're wearing better armor at 95 value. Leadership is still solid. Uh, the offensive and defense stats are a lot better. And because you're holding the halberd, you actually still have the armor-piercing weapon and you still do quite a bit of bonus against large at 20 points. In terms of abilities, you are getting the best of all the units we've seen from before. We're going to end up with expert charge defense against all enemies and charge reflection as well. Uh, there is no defensive stance that is unique to Jade Warriors. You still have the same battle harmony as before. Everyone has formation attack and it's still generally a defensive unit despite having more offensive stats uh, across the board. It's just a more elite unit. And that's going to be a trend for pretty much all of Grand Cafe's infantry as they tend to be more defensive to protect their range component in order to better execute their battle harmony. Now this is a tier 3 unit, uh, it still has a small entity mass of 125, but there's only 100 unit per retinue here, uh, the least that we have seen so far compared to the 160 and 120 from the previous uh, 3 unit set that we saw. And now with the infantry options all covered, we're moving on to range missile infantry. And starting things off, we'll go with the cheapest option again, which is the peasant archer at 450 costs. And very much like their melee counterpart, the peasant long spearmen, these are going to be your expendable cheap end option here. The melee stats are much worse, and there's really not too much to talk about for the actual melee component. Once these guys get into melee combat, they're pretty much toast. The range component with 140 range, 22 ammo, which is going to be default across the board for all multiplayer Cathay missile infantry. Uh, it's going to be the same 22 ammo uh, for every single type of unit. Uh, the range is okay at 140. You'll see a couple different options later on uh, to kind of give you a comparison of the relative values. Missile strength at 15 is not bad in terms of just the number. Uh, what's bad here is that the base damage is 14 and armor piercing damage is only 1. So against high armor targets, you're not really going to be doing much damage. The reload time is actually pretty fast at 9.9, uh, which can be decreased for all Cathay range units with the battle harmony of up to 24 points of reload skill added uh, if you have the right amount of amplifier. Not too much to say about this unit, your cheap and fodder range unit. Uh, might not be the best option, given the fact that you will most likely not be able to protect these or they might not be worth protecting in essence. Uh, you might just want one of them to perhaps trigger some uh, battle harmony, but there are better options as we'll make note later on. Then moving up to 500 costs, we have the Iron Hail Gunners. So these are going to be slightly different from your bow and crossbow unit. They're going to be using a small shotgun that fires three projectiles per volley and the damage is going to be three base 11 armor piercing so quite high armor piercing 
reload speed of 11.7, which is going to be the same as the crossbow reload speed. Uh, it's definitely slower than the bow, but uh, with the harmony of in giving up reload skills, that could improve quite a bit. And looking at the stats, melee stats still terrible. Uh, the ammo is default at 22 for all missile infantry, which we already talked about. Range is much lower for these sort of shotgun-like um, gunners. Um, there's going to be 90. And it's going to require a bit more of a clear line of sight for these units to really get a clear shot off or the right elevation. Uh, if you're firing, you know, over large units or perhaps over uh, difficult terrain, they might not be able to fire as intended. They're going to have a smaller unit size of only 90. Mass is going to be quite small. Uh, this obviously compares with a peasant, which has 120 per retinue. These are only going to have 90, but they're going to be the cheap end armor piercing range option for the Grand Cathay army. Then taking a small pay jump to 600, we have the Jade Warrior Crossbowman. So we return to the Jade Warrior unit type, this time with a range crossbow. Same 80 armor, high leadership, the melee stats a little bit less than the melee counterpart, which is expected. The range is going to be 160. The line of sight requirement for these is not as bad as the gunners, but still not as loose as the bowmen. Uh, missile strength of 21, 18 6 split here, mainly base damage. Now the reload speed, as we mentioned, is going to be 11.7, same as the gunners. And overall, the ability is going to be very familiar with most Jade Warriors. You're going to still have defensive stance, which can give you up to 10 points of armor for staying still. And you still have the in-battle harmony to help you reduce that reload speed. So overall, a pretty sturdy unit uh, with 90 in the group, mass of 100, nothing too special there. Uh, you're going to be able to dish decent amount of damage, but most of it will not be armor piercing, despite the illusion of using a crossbow. Uh, you still have a bit of that damage, 6 points, just not going to be the majority of your damage. Then at 700 cost, we have a unit that's pretty much the same. So there's not too much to talk about here. This is going to be the Jade Warrior Crossbowman with shields. You can see a small shield on their back. And that's going to mean they're going to have that 35% chance range block chance from the front. And their weapon damage is the same exact. They're the same unit. It costs 100 more to get that 35% shield. Whether that's worth it or not really depends on the enemy you're fighting. Now typically, because you already have such high armor, uh, I think you'll be fine against most range armies if it's on the cheaper end. If you're fighting against a particular range army with high armor piercing, then perhaps the 35% shield will benefit you and it might be worth the cost, or else you might as well just go with the non-shielded variety if you have ways to keep them safe from enemy range fire, as there is no difference in their stat aside from that shield. Then moving on to something a bit different, at 900 cost we have Crane Gunners, which is going to be a specialist missile unit holding sort of a sniping gun with a giant shield component that stabilizes the gun and help you block enemy missile fire. And the shield itself is actually going to give you 65% range block chance against enemy small arm missile fires from the front. The gun itself has extremely long range of 275, decent damage with most of it being armor piercing, 6 base, 30 armor piercing, reload speed of 10.8, and it's going to have a special attribute of shield breaker, which will reduce enemy range missile block chance by 24. Overall, seems to be a pretty strong unit, but the damage is not going to be that high actually, mainly because there are only 32 of them. So there are 32 pairs actually, there are 64 units in this group. Uh, one's holding a shield, one's holding a gun for, you know, 32 pairs of working guns. So a lot less units firing compared to uh, the 90 from all the Jade crossbowmen or the 120 from the Peasant Archer. So that's why their damage is going to feel a little lacking. Perhaps against a single entity, they will shine quite a bit at long range. And at worst, they can help pull enemy units perhaps in campaign from defensive positions by laying fire on them from afar to force them to charge at you. That is always a great thing against the AI. Uh, but in multiplayer, that might not work as well as their total damage output is just not going to be that high simply due to the fact they only have so many units. And lastly, at 1100 costs, we once again have a Celestial Dragon Crossbowman and very much like its melee counterpart, it's going to end up having 95 armor with a shield that blocks 35% chance, so same defensive setup. 
Melee capabilities is okay. It's not terrible. So if these guys get into a fight, it's not so bad. Uh, their range is 160, same as the crossbow from the Jade Warriors, or the Jade Crossbowmen, I should say. Uh, but their weapon damage is a bit different, whereas the Jade Crossbowmen was 18.6 with mainly base damage. The crossbow here on the Celestial Dragon Crossbowmen are going to be 5 and 12, and per volley is going to be 2 shots per volley, so quite interesting in terms of getting extra bolts per volley. I think on paper it will just have more consistent damage against units with like range block chance because you have a better shot of at least hitting something per ammo. Um, so average out to pull a slightly better damage, um, but that's here or there. It's not going to make a huge difference like over the course. Uh, the expected value is still going to be the same regardless of how many shots per volley you dish out, just that you have a better chance of hitting them with something per volley compared to just one shot. Um, these units having 80, it's not a huge punishment for being a tier 3 unit compared to the melee variety because you're only going down from 90. So their overall damage is still going to be pretty decent and the fact that they're pretty capable in melee will definitely help them out as well. There's not much ability on these guys so not really much to talk about, just a great elite stat, uh, elite unit here with decent range options. Then moving on to our cavalry options, we start out with the cheapest peasant horseman at 400. And just so we're clear, something I probably should have mentioned earlier, we're showcasing all the unit sizes on ultra unit size. So on ultra unit size, the cavalry is going to default to 60 unit per cavalry group, and the mass is going to be 600, which is going to determine how much knockback these units can dish out on infantry with, you know, 100, 125, 150 mass. So the higher the value, the more knockback you have, and obviously the cavalry units being a large unit will be able to dish out that damage. Now like the peasant counterparts for range and melee, these peasant horsemen are going to be expendable. They're also going to have vanguard deployment. They're quite fast at 90 speed, and they still have decent leadership, but all peasant units have only 15 armor. That's really their weakness. They're quite fragile. And in terms of how these units will be useful, typically light cavalry and warhammer is not as strong as Three Kingdom per se, for those of you coming from uh, that game. They tend to be a little bit too fragile and the charge is not going to do as much damage. Therefore, they typically get wiped out in extended fight after the charge. Uh, it's quite hard to use. So their main purpose really is to just chase down routing enemies and wiping them out, uh, perhaps in campaign or if you have a shattered unit in multiplayer that you don't want to bounce back send in your light cavalry to just get the chase on so they don't actually uh, come back from their morale loss, which is a great way to use these units. Uh, they will be great in that regard, but if you're hoping to have them charge at the enemy um, and dish out damage, that might be a bit disappointing. So that's really how you want to approach light cavalry here in Warhammer. But if you are looking forward to some classic hammer and void cavalry action, you still have the possibility of using heavy cavalry. So Jade Lancers here at 800 cost. We're looking at sort of a cataphract unit with the horse having armor as well. 100 armor total for Jade units. Uh, I'm assuming 80s on the unit and 20s on the horse. You have the same shield, which grants 35%. Good leadership. A massive loss of speed compared to the peasant variety from 90 to 66. Uh, damage still a bit lacking, you have more charge, no fancy abilities, and obviously way more mass at 1,100, granting you much more cleaner charges into enemy units, allowing potential cycle charges. So this is the unit that you want to use for the classic uh, hammer and anvoy type of tactic with cavalry and with their much higher armor value, they have a much better chance of surviving these engagement to allow for more charges in the future. Then moving up to 1,500 costs, we take to the skies with the Great Loma Riders, and these you can think as celestial dragon units on winged horses that are called Loma or dragon horses, and there are not many of them. There's only 24 of them. They have heavy mass of 1,010 because they are a heavily armored cavalry unit of 110 armor, same shield, 35% block chance, high leadership, and the most impressive thing about them is they have extremely high speed due to their wings, I'm assuming, 105 speed, and even if you land them, they still have 105 speed, which is great. So you can move them or fly them, 
into a Vance position or a flanking position, land them, have them charge as regular cavalry, or just fly over the enemy melee units and swoop down from the skies with a sky charge at the enemy range units. Uh, these are very flexible units, very, very powerful. That's why they have such high cost. Uh, the charge bonus is the highest we've seen so far at 75. Um, great weapon strength, um, not majority, you know, armor piece and damage, but still very high ratio in terms of total damage here. And then decent melee attack and melee defense here. So great unit overall, very expensive. You don't get many of them, but they definitely will, you know, dish out their weight in damage. Then slightly more expensive than the Great Loma Riders, we have the Terracotta Sentinel at 1,600. This is the only construct unit available to the Grand Cathay roster at this point, and it is a giant monster uh, construct. It's cumbersome, means it will have slower attack speed, but it more than makes up for it with its extremely high weapon strength of 600, majority of that being armor piercing weapon damage. Not only that, its attacks are considered magic attacks, so it will bypass most physical resistances, and it has very high melee attack. So this is your offensive design unit here. It's also unbreakable. It's single entity, high armor of 100, uh, extreme mass, 6,500 mass, so imagine the collisions there. Lastly, because it's single entity, it will have the wound trait, which means once it dips below 25% health, it will lose 20% base weapon damage and 20% armor piercing weapon damage. So basically 20% less damage overall and minus 10% speed just to reward the enemy side or the attacking side for wounding this single entity. So it reduces inefficiency, whereas, you know, units with um, a lot of single, uh, red news with a lot of single units inside, if you wipe out, you know, 75% of them, they're gonna lose a lot of effectiveness. There's less units hitting back at you and so forth. So this is sort of the way to balance out single entities here. It also causes terror and fear, which means it's also immune to fear and terror, which doesn't really matter for it because it's unbreakable, but in general, causing fear and terror will help route the enemy by reducing their leadership. It is a siege attacker, which means you can use it to instantly start siege battles, and you can use this to attack city gates if you want. So. Just a very awesome unit that I'm very eager to try out uh, in the coming campaigns. I uh, feel like this could be a very meme doomstack unit with multiple uh, Terracotta Sentinel in the army. Then we take to the skies again with the Flying War Machines. There is first the Sky Lantern. This is the cheaper variety at 900 cost. It does not have a cannon mounted on space. It has four crane gunners essentially inside with the same range, but much higher damage. But because there's only four of them, don't expect a lot of damage output from them. Despite the 22 base, 108 uh, armor piercing here, it's massive numbers, but you only have four gunners with 30 ammo, so total damage is not going to be super high. These are constantly flying. You should not see these as offensive units. These are support units. They have two functions. They provide the harmony of in for the melee unit beneath them and they have Eyes of the Dragon, which will grant forest spotting across the map and leadership plus four across the map. So it's an encourage sight giving unit that also gives you the battle harmony mechanic. It's single entity, so it still has wounds. It always has to fly, but it can also shoot while moving. So you can have it as a mobile sniping platform. But as we mentioned, the damage is not gonna be super high just because you're limited to how many guns you have on this ship. And if we jump up to 1,500 cost, we have the Sky Junk, the upgraded version of the Sky Lantern. They're gonna have the mounted fire ring rocket on the base. There's only gonna be one fire ring rocket on this machine with four crane gunners still. So you have both components. Uh, it's still relatively a support unit. Um, you still get the nice rocket damage, 360 range, 622 blanket fire in 7 volleys per shot. Um, it's quite nice, uh, I quite like the firing rocket, and the effectiveness is going to vary quite a bit depending on the unit size you're playing on uh, for two factors. First factor is the Sky Junk is always one entity, but the ground version of the firing rockets comes in four rockets if you're on ultra diff, uh, ultra unit size 
If you scale it down, it could just be one rocket. So if you're playing on small unit sides, then the Sky Junk has tremendous value because it's essentially getting an entire Fire Rain Rocket ground unit in the air, elevated, you know, being able to see clearly not have any terrain issues or any, uh, you know, line of sight issues, firing down on the enemy with 15 ammo. But if you're playing on ultra unit sides, you're only getting one fourth of the ground variety uh, where the cost will stay the same. So that's going to be the small difference there. And also depending on how clustered the enemy are, if they're on small, certainly they're hard to hit. But also when you hit them, they're pretty much done for. Uh, if you get a direct hit with like the seven volleys, hit them with like three of them, then they're just pretty much wiped. Uh, whereas on ultra, it's harder to miss because there are just so many units, but you're also not going to do as much damage given there's more enemies to hit. Uh, it still has all the support functions, Eye of the Dragon and Wound's mechanic for being single entity, it's always flying. There is an added ability called the Sky Junk Bomb. This is a bomb placed at the base of your ship, and it will literally drop a bomb over where it's standing. And it drops when you activate. There's three uses, you can see the shape there is friendly fire. I have done some very stupid things with this where I have killed a lot of my own units. But in essence, you want to fly your sky junk over the enemy formation, drop the bomb, and dish out explosive damage on the ground beneath you. Uh, obviously, the effectiveness of both the sky junk and the sky lantern is going to determine by how many flying enemies you're facing. If the enemy don't have any flyers and don't have a lot of ranged threats, your Sky Junks and Sky Lanterns will rule the sky. Nothing can basically touch you at that point. And you have free time firing your crane gunners, you have free time shooting your rockets and dropping your bombs. Everything is great. If the enemy have an overwhelming amount of air units and you only have Loma as your other air threat, it's going to be very difficult to protect these. Now, of course, you have your Dragon Lords, they could come into air and help you out. But in essence, they're quite fragile despite having high health. There's not a lot of return fire. They're not really melee unit. They're sort of a range support unit in the air. So you gotta consider that when you're using these in terms of what type of enemy you might run into. Alrighty, and we can move on to the actual artilleries on the ground. Now, as I mentioned, we're showcasing this on ultra unit size and we're gonna have four of the cannons here for the grand cannons per unit. And these are going to be the longest range artillery that Grand Cathay has. They're only going to cost you 900 uh, for multiplayer in terms of cost. 450 is very long range, but they only fire one shell per shot. Uh, long reload speed, of course, which can be shortened quite a bit with the you know battle harmony mechanic, which is going to be super nice. They're also a siege attacker. Not too much to see there. Lots of armor piercing damage. Their shots are considered a flaming attack, as with all artillery shots uh, for Grand Cafe, which means units hit by them will lose half of their healing rate, and if they're vulnerable to fire, it will dish out additional damage. Um, obviously, these things are fragile. If you get them into melee, uh, you're pretty much doomed. Alrighty, and as we move up to 1,100 costs, we have the Wuxing War Compass, and we're showing two here because these are different despite looking almost the same. The one on the left here, which I have selected, is the unit of Wuxing War Compass. It's a magic chariot with melee stats. You can ram this at people, but the main thing you want to use this for is to cast spells. It has Celestial Comet. It's a shorter range uh, bombardment spell that deals more damage with slightly longer cooldown, costing 13 Winds of Magic. And there's the Celestial Lightning, longer range, less damage bombardment that costs 6 with slightly shorter cooldown. Nothing too crazy there, and obviously it has the Master of Elemental Winds, which means you have more units in the army with uh, the same trait, basically magic users. Your spells will all do more damage. You get a higher uh, multiplier here at the end, uh, so basically all your spells become stronger. It also has ability to help you recharge your power for spells, wins magic a little bit faster here. Uh, it will have 15% missile resistance, which is just a nice little bonus. Aside from that, nothing too fancy here. What we have here is actually an Astromancer. So the Wuxing War Compass can be a mount for an Astromancer hero. 
It looks identical because the regular one also has an Astromancer on it, but this one's actually an Astromancer hero that you have with the mount on the skill tree selected to be the Wuxing War Compass. It will have higher stats, uh, basically. You'll get uh, more weapon strength on the melee for the you know cart itself, and you have more spells depending on what skill tree you pick for your Astromancer. So this basically will just be your Astromancer. Um, we're not really showcasing Astromancer and Alchemist for this unit roster because it depends a lot on how you build them up with the skill tree. Not really a regular unit, uh, they're more of a hero. So just wanted to say that you can use them as mounts here. Then for our final unit, we have the Firing Rockets at 1,300 costs. We kind of already talked about them while they were on the Sky Junk. They have the same stats, 100 or 360 range. 622 shots, uh, damage for 7 volleys per shot, 12 ammo here for the ground variety, so actually less than the sky variety, but as I mentioned, on ultra unit size you get 4 of these, whereas you will get it 1 if you play on small, and that would be the same as the air variety, and then the air variety would be better since you have the elevation and more ammo as well. Uh, not a lot of fancy stats on this, you don't want to get these units in melee, uh, they basically will die, no stats there. And they have a nice boost from Battle Harmony, which will help their long reload speed. And the Siege Attacker will allow you to attack gates and also to launch sieges without wasting a time building the required towers and so forth. So that's going to really do it for our Grand Cafe unit roster overview. There are 19 units so far before any DLC adds new units for Grand Cafe. If you enjoy content like this, please consider subscribing as I will be doing full roster overviews for all the Warhammer 3 factions during this pre-release embargo period. If you're curious about the exact schedule that I'll be doing them, please check out the community page on my YouTube channel for the full upload schedule or check out the announcement channel in my Discord, which you can join using the invite link in the description below. So thank you all for watching to this very end and I will see you all next time. Bye!